they're going to be taking up an offering. <laughs> Praise the Lord. This morning, we're dealing with Colossians chapter 3. I'm going to read it from the Amplified Version. So I just want you to listen. Don't turn. Don't fidget. Just listen. Colossians 3, 1 to 17 says, Therefore, if you have been raised with Christ to a new life, Sharing in his resurrection from the dead. Keep seeking the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind and keep focused habitually on the things above, the heavenly things, not on things that are on the earth, which have only temporal value. For you died to this world. We're a bunch of dead people. We die to this world and your new life is hidden with Christ in God. So put to death and deprive of power the evil longings of your earthly body with its sensual, self-centered instinct, immorality, impurity, sinful passion, evil desire, and greed, which is a kind of idolatry because it replaces your devotion to God. Because of these sinful things, the divine wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience who fail to listen and who routinely and obstinately disregard God's precept. Can you hear that? Yeah. And in these sinful things, you also once walked when you are habitually living in them without the knowledge of Christ. But now, everybody say, but now. now. Rid yourself completely of all these things. Anger, rage, malice, slander, obscene, abusive, filthy, vulgar language from your mouth. Do not lie one to another. For you have stripped off the old self with its evil practices and have put on a new spiritual self who is being continually renewed in truth, in knowledge, in the image of him who created the new self. So God has chosen his own people who are holy, set apart, sanctified for his purpose and well-beloved by God himself. These people put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, which has the power to drop whatever injustice or unpleasantness that comes with good temper. Amen. Mic drop. Amen. <laughs> Do I need to preach any further? The word of God has said it. I wish I could really drop the mic. God has said what we need to become. We have read the theme for the month. We are now focusing our attention on God's will and purpose for our lives. This morning, I would like to speak on the topic, and I pick a few. So whichever fits you, pick it. Run from the liar. Give me more of you, Jesus. One more chance, Jesus. Anything that suits you this morning, I want you to grab a hold of it this morning because I am really upset with Samson. You know Samson? In the book of Judges, there's this young man that was called from birth to be an example of God's people. He was called with a special um, assignment. He was on a mission from the womb to deliver and rescue God's people. We're going to read from chapter 13 all the way to chapter 16 in Judges. Samson's birth was announced in chapter 13. In this birth, God gave this mom special assignment to her diet, the things that she was supposed to do. In chapter 14, Samson is born. He becomes a young man, but a young man with a gift, a talent, that nobody could understand or even try to mimic or pattern. He was assigned with this gift and this talent 
but he was far from God. He was far from even the memory of the vow that was made. Young people this morning, I want us to know that we need to be close to God with all of our gifts, with all of our talents, Amen. with all of our abilities, because it is not yours. Amen. It was a gift from God right. to be used for his purpose. Samson seeks companionship with a woman who is not an Israelite, going against God's word that prohibit and prohibited intermarriage with people outside of Israel. He enters a vineyard, a place he shouldn't have gone to. He is confronted by a lion whom he slays, and later this very same lion, he goes to the lion and he removes honey from the carcass of the lion, gives it to his parents to eat, and does not want to tell them where he got it from. This is some kind of obnoxious child. Can you imagine? Now, in chapter 15, he goes for a wife. He takes himself a wife. And not only does he take himself a wife, he, re he begins to, to booster up himself in his strength and in his emotion. Something goes wrong, he gets mad. But he doesn't just get mad. He gets very old mad. He turns bitter green. And in this revenge, his heart is filled with anger, something that we just read that shouldn't have been a part of his lifestyle. He was malicious, something we shouldn't see in a believer. He was revengeful, he was just up there in God's face and saying, I'm just going to do this for myself. And he takes the job out of an ass and he slays over 300 Philistines. Sorry, over 1,000 Philistines. Not only does he slay them, he takes the foxes that God created, tie them together, set them on fire, and he sent them through the field because he was a man that he lost his wife. A wife God never gave him. Mm, come on. His emotion takes over. Again, he goes in chapter 16, he goes to Gaza to pick up a prostitute. This is the young man of God, chosen by God to deliver God's people full of flaws. But there's something special about this young man. The Spirit of God continues to move on him. Hallelujah. Young people, I want you to say there's hope for me. Amen. Amen. The Spirit of God continues to stir him. He goes on in the scripture and says that he not only goes to get a prostitute, but on the way to find the prostitute, he falls in love with another woman. Do you see how sexual this young man is? He falls in love with the wrong woman this time. Her name is Delilah. Mm. And the road to his demise begins with Delilah. I want you to know this morning that Samson was born during a time when everyone did what was right in their own eyes. This is where we are. It was a time when God and role models were far and few between. It was a time when worldliness was at its peak. And that term worldliness, and I need you to get this into your mind and your spirit, it does not mean necessarily don't do this or do that. Worldliness simply means that you said with your mouth, you confessed with your heart, you spoke it out loud that you're a believer. But worldliness is this. You said you're a believer, but your actions are saying quite the opposite. That you're not really a believer. That is worldliness. It is the way you view yourself in relation to what God requires of you. So if you agree with God and His word suits you, you comply quickly. You say, oh, I like that, Jesus. That sounds good. I can work with that. But if He says something that is hard, something that you don't quite agree with, then you start to agree with your culture. You start to agree with your friends. You start to agree with your professor, who's much more smarter than our pastors. You start to agree on the opposite side, and you say, you know what, God? You might not have meant what you said. 
So we start to even reinterpret what we think God meant with his words. This is where we are living. We can all agree that this is the world that we commonly right now live in. We love the creation of God more than we love the creator of God. Yes. Somebody say that. Amen. Yes. That's right. But we are called. Say, I am called. I am chosen to let my light shine. Right here. Right now. In this world. We are reminded daily by God's word. That we are to bear fruits of righteousness. We are to exemplify the character of Christ. Samson was called to such a world where everything was right in anybody's eye. In Judges 13 verse 7 we read, But he said unto me, Behold, you shall conceive, bear a son, and now drink no wine, nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing, for the child shall be a Nazarite, not just for a season, not just until he becomes a teenager. Are you getting it? You are called not just when you are a child and then when you become a teenager, you don't know who God is anymore. But you are called to go through with God. Samson was called from the womb to continue to live as a Nazarite until the day of his death. Young people, we are called to live for Jesus until we die. Amen. It is not a seasonal option. It is not an option for when things are going great, we're good. And when things are not going so great, we're not going to bother with him. But until the breath leaves your body, we are called to live and to be an example of who Christ is. Three things I want you to remember this morning that helps us understand the theme and Samson. Number one, when he was chosen, God said to his mother, why you watch what he eats? Everything that goes into his body, you need to watch. And all the nurses say amen. All the nutritionists say amen. Pastor Mary Sir, please say amen. Everything that goes into the body, why? Because God's going to use your body. You're his hands. You're his feet. And if you can't outrun the devil, you gotta fix that body. You gotta do something with your body. Your body, your mouth is not just created for food. You understand? And I'm not speaking anymore about food. Food is good. Food is really good. But your body is the temple of God. And what you put in there makes all the difference to what you have to do. This young man, Samson, was not supposed to drink alcohol. He was not even supposed to go near it. Our bodies are to demonstrate how God transforms and renew people. If you used to get alcoholic when he changes, you don't drink anymore. If you used to smoke, when it changes you, you don't smoke anymore. Your lungs will appreciate that. And you will be able to share the testimony of what God did in this temporal body. Somebody say amen. amen. So we know as young people, it's not just to walk around and look good and get all of it that we put over this body. But it's what that goes in matters to God. The other thing about Samson that we need to understand is his appearance. He was not to cut his hair. He was supposed to let his hair grow because in the growing of the hair was where God was going to manifest some things. Your appearance is not just about what you put on or take off. It's your habits. Amen. If I call somebody's name, what is the first part that you think of? If I say that this person is always, what would you be able to put? Whose name would you put there and put yours first? If I said that this person is always hanging around, what would you put there? Your association is also your appearance. Because believe me, we see with our eyes. So if you're telling me you're 
a good person and you're not doing anything good, I can't agree, agree with you. I can't come to that conclusion. If you're telling me that you are great at doing this or the other and you're completely the opposite of what you said, you have now told me what to look for with my eyes. Your habits, your association, your attitude, and your behavior all has to do with what people see. When you say you're a Christian, they are looking for the evidence. Amen. Amen. I don't even name it over here. Come on, you're my backup. The evidence that we are who God says we are comes out in our habits. The things that we love to do and do consistently without breaking a pattern. The, the evidence that I'm a believer will say that when it's time to pray, I know how to kneel down as we have said, if you want worship, I'm going to bow down. Your appearance matters to the world because they're looking to see Jesus. I remember when I got saved and I in my, my, my bio, it says my principal called me into his office after I did something horrible in the hallway. And I thought for sure this man was going to kick me out of school, he was going to expel me. And you know what he did? He sat me down and he said, do you know Jesus? I guess he needed an extra divine help with me. <laughs> And he introduced me to Jesus on Friday, and on Monday he was dead. That was his last assignment to me. So your appearance, what you, what you look like, people are expecting you to be real. That's right. Hallelujah. People are expecting you to, to live what you say. If you confess it with your mouth, live it out. This is the above life. The third thing with Samson was his faith. His vow was supposed to separate him from other people. He was called into the service of God to do a special job on the earth. God alone was to be his strength. His purpose was not just to lift up and tear lions apart and throw up a, a thousand Philistines like they were twins. His purpose was to show how God used his people. Now who would have thought that strength would have been a talent? Hmm. Huh? Who would have been that? Come on. Who would have think that lifting up some weights would have been a blessing to somebody? But now the gym looks good. We're going to uh, gravitate to that a little bit. Because sometimes we think all the gifts that we have is just singing and dancing. We think that's all we can offer to God. But God took this man's body. God said, I'm going to demonstrate my power through your body. What you eat matters to me. Amen. What you put on on the outside matters to me. How you conduct yourself matters to me. What people see when they see you matters to me. Amen. Everything about Samson mattered to God. He was not to be unequally yoked. But this young man kept joining himself to the wrong people. Now, sometimes we blame the parents and we say it was the parents' fault. You know, my mom was not praying, mother. You know, my dad was a drunk or something. He didn't discipline me right. He didn't set us an example. But that wasn't Samson's problem. His parents were praying people. In fact, his father went to the angel and said, let me know, how shall we order the child? He wanted to know exactly what to do to raise his son in a godly household. Children, give it up for your parents. Amen. If you have Christian parents, give it up for them. It is not easy to raise ungodly children in a Christian home. But the parents fight with it every single day. God said in his word that the man of God went and asked, how do you want me to raise my son? He had enough religious training. He went to Sunday school. And this is what makes me mad about Samson. This boy was in the house of God every moment that he got. He sat under the voice of the speaker every Sunday. 
He knew what it was that he was supposed to do. He knew the doctrines that what the word of God said. But I want you to know you can sit in a million Sunday school classroom and be disconnected from God. If your heart is not present, if your spirit is not present, your body might be here, but where are you right now? Oh, hallelujah. Samson was in the right place, under the right tutelage, with the right parents, but that boy decided in his mind he was going to do what he's going to do, and he can't wait to get out of those people's hair. Oh, help us this morning, Lord. His affections was not set on God. Some of us are here because our parents dragged us in. And if we could only see the battle in the car to get you here. We are here sometimes not because we love to be among the people of God. It is because we have no choice. Because we are young and we are under somebody's rule. But God help us when we turn 14. Fourteen. Let me chop it a little lower. God help mom and dad when I turn nine. And if you hit me, I'm gonna call. Go oh, hallelujah. Samson, his affection was not with the people of God. Your affections reveal your thoughts, what you're thinking about. Your affections will tell what your goals are, what you are determined to do. If your affection is on Christ, we will see how it manifests in your life. Or oh, somebody say amen this morning. It is what you're fond of doing. And I'm going through these definitions because I want the young people to get it. You can't miss it this morning. Your affection is what you say. I love so much. I love it like I love mango. <laughs> That's my affection. If you love me, you give me a mango. <laughs> I love it like I love dry figs. If it's in the mall, anywhere it is, I'm going to find it and buy it. Your affections drive you to do things. It commits you to something. So this morning I want to ask, I don't think I'm just speaking on this just because you're up here and not there. I want to ask the young people this morning, where are your affections? Where is your commitment? What is it that you are devoted to? What is it that drives your passion? That when we say we're going to have a sleepover, that's all you're ready for. Ah. Samson had some great passions, but not for God. Hallelujah. He was chosen, but not committed. He was separated, but got entangled with the world's affection. He was sensual in his affection, lustful in his passion, perverted in his thinking, weak in his commitment, Lacking wisdom from above. And had it not been for the grace of the Lord, Hallelujah. there goes I. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yes. Come, on. Come on, you. I want you to stick with me this morning. We understand that God has chosen us. That's why you're here. He thought about you, He gave His Son that you might have life. Jesus died to set you free from sin. What is it that is keeping us constantly looking backward, looking within and saying, Jesus, it's not enough. Help us this morning, Lord. Samson did not obey God's word. He did not honor and respect God's calling on his life. He took for granted Everything that he was. He took his parents for granted. He was born to an elderly parent. He was born at a time in their lives when it was a miracle to have a child. And he took it for granted that spoiled brat called Samson. Everything he needed, they had to get for him. Probably they were scared of his muscles. He had some abusive power. 
interested in his own self. Now many of us young people may have parents, may even be living with our grandparents, and God help the grandparents and they can't provide whatever it is that you need. Why do we need to wear a $200, $400 shoe? And a one-car parent. And groceries not bought. And be very practical things because I'm mad at Samson. Why is it that we need to stress, set up our parents' blood pressure? Almost cause them to die so we can walk around and smile with everybody else with the same shoes on. Even though we said we are different from them. There's no uniqueness because we're the same. We're wearing the same thing, carrying the same bag. You can say amen, come on. Yeah. You can say amen. We're doing the same thing, yet we're saying we are different. Speaking one way, acting another way, worldly. Saying that we are this when we are something else. Samson had the nerve to go tell his dad, Dad, I see this woman that I like. Mm. Scripture says, Samson said, she pleased me well. Lustful. She pleased me well. She got it in the right places. She got it from the top to the bottom. She just can't stop. His father said to him, and his mother said to him, look at all these young ladies we have in church. Look at all these young men we have in church. And Samson said, where, 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 where? So he goes hunting, and he disregards his upbringing. Oh, hallelujah. He disregards God's commitment over his life to preserve and to keep his purpose intact. He disregards and he dishonors his parents and he says, well, you better get her for me. Now he's ordering them around, dismissing their authority as if he birthed himself. His mother could not have been black. <laughs> and not even a black to me. He acted as if he brought himself into this world Serve everything that they were supposed to give to. I heard children say, I didn't ask to be born. <laughs> After they have, come on, Samson, you make me mind this morning. After they have suffered with you for nine months, swell foot, big nose, can't walk, have to buy a new wardrobe every week. Now you come to tell your parents, the people who go. Yeah. 
it again. Amen. Speak up and improperly to the elders of the church. Walk around and abuse anybody without even saying good morning. We need to understand that everything that we are, what we look like, what we sound like, shows what God looks like. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah to God. This young man never understood that sin must never control you. Sin does not control us. It has no dominion over us. We are a new creation. We are a new people. We are God's children. Sin does not control me. Hallelujah. A true Christian cannot be happy living in habitual sin. That means over and over we're praying for the same demon to come out of you. When I was younger, they used to do that for me. Every Sunday I had to get a demon out. Every Sunday, every church service, the poor pastor was so tired. She just rolled her eyes and said, Lord God. A true Christian cannot remain happy continually having sin, having dominion over them. We must not even be able to say, I have to bridle my tongue. You understand that? Your thoughts should be so easy and so free that you can just open your mouth and speak. Because what's coming out? Goodness, yeah, encouragement, that's right. inspiration, motivation. You don't have to say, well, I just gotta keep my mouth. Let me just keep my tongue. You see the difference? We should be living in such a way that it's easy for us to be a believer. Sounds not all kinds of sin problem. Living self-centered, it's self-gratification. Living just to please himself. He did not put to death, as the scripture says. He did not deprive the power of the evil longings in his earthly body. He did not stop his impure thoughts. He did not stop the greed and the desire to continue to walk the way he was walking. His focus was off God. Help us this morning, Lord. Amen. Amen. Jesus, Jesus. We are called, but we need God to anoint us again. God's purpose must be seen in our lives. We cannot lose our purpose. Tell your neighbor, don't lose your purpose. Don't lose your purpose. Frying pan is to fry with. It can't drink water out of it. Don't let the enemy confuse you as to who you are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are born with a particular calling on your life. You may not know what it is, but that doesn't mean you live any and any out. Can you figure it out? Constantly bowing. Constantly asking. Take me higher, Lord. Lift me up, Lord Jesus. Strengthen my weakness, Lord. God, clear me up. Cheer me up. Move me. Do something in me. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. The youthful lust inside of us must not manage us. Somebody said, run from the lila. <laughs> Young men said, run from the lila. You know what the lila is? Lila sweet like sugar. She's the sugar dumps. She is the one that is coy. She is the one that can get you to do anything without even asking. She just has to look at you. And it's done. Poor Samson thought he had strength, but he did not meet upon the female strength. He thought he was able to control his passion, but the lion just had to say, Hello. My name is the lion. How are you? That's all she had to say. She didn't have to say, I am from here, my parents are this or that. He was like, Delilah. Delilah. We need to run from Delilah. Amen. 
Do not allow Delilah to cause you to put your head on her lap of comfort. Do not allow Delilah to manipulate the spirit of God that is in you. That says, if you don't do this, this is what's going to happen. And you got to do this or else you're going to marry. Oh God forbid. Young man, I love my boys. And I'm telling you, when I see that female spirit of Delilah rising up in church, I want to put the holes out and just quench the man. Do not allow Delilah to cause your head, your head, your mind, your thoughts to rest in the lap of confusion and in the lap of the enemy of God. She is an idol worshiper. Her God is not your God. Her belief is not your belief. Her ways are not your ways. Run from Delilah. Hallelujah. If you are risen with Christ, and if you have a relationship with Jesus, if you call him your Savior, you must live differently. Hallelujah. 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 You must be conscious about pleasing God. With your attitude, your behavior, your action. You must put off the old nature. You are a sanctified vessel set apart. Think on the things that are above. Things that are pleasant. Things that are true. Things that are respectful. If your peer beside you is disrespectful, walk away so they don't associate you. Am I talking true? If somebody is in your life that is a ragamuffin, just raga raga take it take There's a word for them. They're just raga. That's all I hear about. They talk anyhow. They just carry themselves anyway. And they want to be your friend. And they're comfortable in your, your presence. Oh, God help us this morning. It must be that when they come in your presence, they say something different. Something must be different. Hallelujah. A rather muffin person who just bad about everybody, complain about everything, grumble about everything, should find peace in your presence. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That is something we need to cultivate. Our minds should be so centered around God that they get confused in our presence. Amen. They start to speak good when they're in our presence. Hallelujah. Amen. We cannot do this by ourselves. Samson thought that he was able to do it by himself, but he needed some help. We need God's help. If you think you don't need God's help, let somebody talk back to you and see what comes up. If you think you don't need God's help, then let somebody even mash you on accidentally. Let them just touch you the wrong way or rub you the wrong way for a minute. And then we will see if we do not need God's help. Do you know why all these things were happening to Samson? Because he needed God's help. God needed to show him that you can't do it by yourself. Pastor, we can't live by ourselves. We can't say that we are good enough. God must be our all and in all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you don't know how to live, ask God to help you. Ask for wisdom that comes from here is wisdom. It is pure, morally, and spiritually undefiled. It is peace-loving, it is courteous and considerate. It is gentle and reasonable and willing to listen. You hear me, young people? Willing to listen. Full of compassion and good fruits. Unwavering self-righteousness is not a part of it. Hypocrisy is not a part of it. We cannot allow ourselves to think that we don't need God's help. Somebody say amen. Yeah. So seek, say it, seek. Seek the 
things that are above. Seek to be like Christ Jesus. Not your daddy or your mama. Seek to be like Jesus. Your father and your mother must carry their own basket. They must walk their own journey. You cannot become like them. You must become like Jesus. You know what I'm saying? You've got to be about Jesus, not about your parents. They're helpful, yes. And you end up looking at doing things just like that anyway. But make sure it's not just about pleasing them, but it's about pleasing the Lord. Whenever Samson got himself into a mess, the Bible says that the Spirit of God stirred him. The Spirit of God inspired and motivated and reminded him of his purpose. Every time he was with the Philistine, the Spirit of God says, remember who you are. Remember why you are here. The Spirit of God gave him a second chance. Finally, on the last leg of his life, the Philistine caught him and the old devil gulched out his eye. Took his sight. Sight is very important. If you are blind, you can't see where you're going. That's right. That's right. You can't read what is in the book for your direction because you're blind. Your understanding of even what somebody is explaining is unclear because you cannot picture it. There's nothing to say, well, yeah, I think I know what you mean because your sight is gone. Young people, when you lose your sight spiritually, you lose your way. Amen. Amen. And so Samson, that devil caught him and blinded him. That devil took away the one thing that he needed, the sight to understand where he was going, what he was about, and what he had to do. But God said, Samson, it's not over here. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. You may be blind. You may be confused. You may have no knowledge of who you really are, no understanding of your gift and your purpose, but it's not over yet. Oh, hallelujah. God is about to turn some things around. The Spirit of God stirred him up in his best, and the hair started to grow back. And the enemy did not realize that God was working on this young man.
Subscribe now. Push 